Hi again then guys and welcome to the second to last episode of the HSG Top 100 featuring of course my 100 favourite vehicles as of 2020 and we've only got one more episode after this which is of course going to be my actual top 10 favourite vehicles spanning cars and bikes. And although this may seem to be a cop-out, I'm sure it will to some people, I was planning, as I even mentioned a few times, to do, as of this episode, from 40 down, in other words, in the exact order of where they would fall as my favourites. But I found that while I was making this video, and even as I started recording it, vehicles were moving still. So, I think the way that I'm going to have to do it is to make the top 10 set in stone, as it would always be for pretty much anyone, and then everything above that I think is going to have to be fairly fluid. Now, to give you some saving grace there, I am going to say that the way in which these vehicles are ordered in this video is actually pretty close to what I would officially place them at anyway. But it's just a simple fact that they do move around to me because I love so many of them so much. So kicking us off first of all is a car which, again, is a huge drop compared to what it was in the top 50. The Remac. In fact, the Remac Concept 1. Now the Concept 2 is of course an even better vehicle technically, but I'm not a fan of the look of that car. And to me, the, again, purity in a similar way to what I spoke about with Koenigsegg of this Concept 1 just appeals to me more. It's one of those weird occasions where it's the total opposite to the Axum Megatrack from the last episode, where that car is so much bigger than it looks. This car, strangely enough, is a lot smaller than it looks. It looks like it could be easily as big as a Koenigsegg. It's not. It's actually barely bigger than a Lotus Elise. It is a tiny car, and the reason why it's dropped down my list so much is as much as I love it, it's one of the cars which I can say for certain I will never be able to drive. Because put simply, I don't fit in the car. And that, as annoying as it is, is just a fact for me. Next up on the list, we're staying in the world of exotics with a car that I've always loved. Uh, to me, it falls into the Gumper Apollo, Ascari, KZ1, and A10 kind of territory, the Zenvo. But interestingly, not the Zenvo that I would usually say, which is the ST1, the original. This is actually the TS1, which seems like a typo, but actually, Zenvo brought back the car in an updated and more reliable presumably form, called the TS1 GT, which has basically the same spec and performance as the ST1, and visually I don't think there's really any difference, but it's basically a continuation of the car. So instead of that initial 15 car production run, they are planning another five cars each year of the TS1. And I think that's pretty cool. It shows that people must have loved that first one for them to be building more. Next up we have what is most definitely a car that has retained its single most important position from the top 50, and that is not where it is on the list, but what it represents. This is my favourite sports car, the Panos Esperante. And spoiler alert, it's one of three Panos models to be in this part of the series. I love this car. It's certainly controversial, but then again, it's Panos. Controversial styling is basically what they do. That pretty much is their brand. And to me, there's just something about this car that I love. I love the purity, that simple, smooth, almost European vibe that it has. And to me, it's very much so America's equivalent to the TVR Tuscan. It's got a Mustang SVT engine, which I believe is one of the best sounding engines ever made. I love the fact that it has this oddball, just unapologetic side to it. And yeah, I love it. It's my dream sports car. The next car on the list is another hugely significant one for me because just like the Panos Esperante is my favourite sports car, this is my favourite JDM car. A car which many of you know because I've mentioned it a number of times, the Integra, the Honda DC2 Integra Type R. But as you'll notice in particular, this one has four doors. And that is specific, because this is the DB8 Integra, because that specifically is my favourite version. As I said before, and as a number of these cars show, I'm a sucker for practicality and performance, and to me there is very little that's better than that mix, than the idea of what is already the greatest front-wheel drive car ever made in my opinion, but with another two doors and extra space. I love it. Next up though, speaking of practicality, a car which some of you may scratch your head about again, and that occurs quite a lot in my top 100, a Marcos, but not just any Marcos, the Mini Marcos. And this is a car which of course you can find in a couple of Gran Turismo games. It's not a car that I think many of you would have in your top 100 probably, but it's a car which 
it just does it for me. You know, it's small, it's cute, it's weird, it's oddball. It's almost like if Panos kind of ironically made a mini. <laughs> it's the same kind of proportions as a classic mini, so it seems weird to me that I would probably fit into this car better than I would in a Remak, because apparently you can't drive the Remak if you're taller than 5'8", whereas I can fit comfortably into a classic mini, so I suspect I could probably fit in a Mini Marcos as well. And also, it's a Lamar car. This car actually competed in the Lamar 24 hour event, and it was the only British car to finish that year. So it's not just a weird little semi pretty face, it's a car that has considerable motorsport pedigree, plus when you factor in the Mini that it's based on, dominated Monaco rallying, well, it's actually a car with as I said, deceptively good pedigree. Next up, we're staying in the world of classics with, of course, a car that was in my top 50, but it has dropped down the list quite a lot for me, the 1959 Cadillac. But here's the crucial thing, not the Buritz. The Buritz was in my list before, but the reason why is because I've actually always liked the hardtop version more, but I didn't realize that the hardtop was technically a different named car the DeVille, which I'd heard of before, but I didn't know that was the designation difference. So technically, the one that I've always loved more is this one, the 59 DeVille Coupe. Next up, a car which will definitely surprise many people who tune in for my Gran Turismo content, because I've said a number of times that it was my favourite Le Mans car of all time, but spoiler alert, it's actually dropped a couple of places down my favourite Le Mans car list, the Nissan, the R92CP, is no longer my favourite Le Mans car, and that wasn't an easy decision to make, but I think it's the true one for me, because yes, it's the end of an era in many ways, the last of the great long tails, one of the most powerful cars ever built for racing in its qualifying form, and a car which was tremendously fast even at Fuji Speedway, let alone Lassart. What an awesome car, and of course, even though it's not technically my favourite Le Mans prototype anymore, it definitely still deserves to be here. Next up, we're actually staying in the world of Le Mans prototypes, but a car which, if it came to a choice of driving an R92CP or one of these for, you know, the day or something at a track day, I would have to choose this one over it. The Panos LMP1 the second Panos of this episode, and a car which I've spoken about at length on the channel, it was also in my top 50, and it's a car which I just love more and more the more I think about it. I think it looks incredible, it's easily prettier, I think, than the GTR one race car was, it tends to be more popular, I think, as well, there aren't as many people who find this one weird looking as the GTR one does, it still has that kind of Batmobile vibe, it sounds like nothing else on the grid with that almost like Mercedes SLR McLaren style bug that it has, and as you can kind of tell, I'm a big fan of American cars, so it's not too surprising that it would be pretty high on my list. Speaking of surprises though, this one probably is, because it's a bike, and it's a bike that has dropped by quite a lot on my overall list, except the weird thing is, it's dropped down the list to about the same point that I already had in the top 50, and that is the Ducati 748 SP. Still my favourite Ducati of all time, still a bike which I love thanks to a racing game, in the same vein of how I love many cars due to experiencing them in games first, and that game was Ducati World Racing. It was not the most powerful bike around, it's only got the power of a Fiat Panda 100 HP, but it's a lot quicker than one. <laughs> 0 to 60, about 3.5 seconds, over 150 miles an hour, and from what I hear, one of the best handling bikes of its time. I love yellow anyway, it's my favourite colour, so the fact that it has that yellow and white livery, as incidental as that may sound, that's actually kind of a big deal for Ducati. They tend to be very strict when it comes to the colours and liveries on their bikes, so to see a yellow one is kind of rare, and the SP and the SPS as well, which is even more hardcore, have that uniquely to them over the normal 748s. Next up on the list, of course, a car that will surprise no one of being in this high, probably some of you would expect it to be even higher, the Pagani Zonda F, in particular the Roadster, one of the very few cars ever built which I would describe simply as perfect. A vehicle which doesn't need any change whatsoever. It has this gorgeous blend of Italian style and almost gothic elegance. It's one of the sharpest, meanest, and yet at the same time prettiest supercars ever built. And to me, the Zonda F, just like the Koenigsegg CCX, was the pinnacle of taking the essential idea and shape of what Pagani started as and really 
making it perfect. Every detail of the Zonda F is everything it needs to be to me. The Cinque is unnecessary, the Tricolori, the HH, all of those that came after are not needed at all. Doesn't need more power, doesn't need more speed, certainly doesn't need a different livery. It is automotive perfection to me. And I love the fact that just like many of the great classics from Italy, it's based on the female form, based apparently on Horatio Pagani's wife. And you can kind of tell some of that feminine influence on the car. It even looks like it has mascara or eyeliner around the lights. Next up, a car which has definitely fallen a lot on my list, and I didn't really have a huge problem with that either, because i just got to be honest about it, the Adonis, a car which is definitely controversially styled, as many of my favourites are. The B-Engineering Adonis is a tremendous machine. It's one of the fastest supercars that people don't give anywhere near the credit that it deserves to, around 229 miles an hour, which is legitimately one of the fastest cars out there, of course based on Bugatti technology, as the name suggests, the EB110 specifically, one of the biggest windshields in the business, one of the most unique design languages in the business as well, and that's what makes it so controversial. And even though they have tried to bring it back more recently with a slight restyling, including different headlights, this one to me is the better looking. And even that to some people will be a strange argument to make, because I know it's a very controversial car in terms of the way it looks. Next up, we have another vehicle that will definitely surprise no one, a Mosler, the Mosla MT900. I love the GTR and I love the Mosla MT900S in particular. The GTR is the fastest road version that they do, pretty much, all round at least. The S, though, just has that simple, single colour purity that I love as well, whereas the GTR has the black roof. I love them both, though. It's a stunning car, it looks fantastic, it has cues from other iconic cars like the XJ220 or a bit of Corvette here and there, but at the same time, it is legitimately one of the finest competition vehicles ever built. A car literally so good that it was banned. Keeping in the vein of orange cars for the image though, the next one will again surprise very few people. One of my favourite brands as well, probably also in my top three alongside Panos, Spyker, the Spyker C8. Spider in particular, not La Laviolet, but the Spider more specifically, and to me it's a stunning looking car. In a similar way to the Zonda F, I think it's a perfect exotic. I love the level of attention to detail that to me those three manufacturers in particular have, Koenigsegg, Pagani and Spiker. Every car that they make as far as I'm concerned is a piece of art, and to me the way that I would sum up any Spiker is to say that it is automotive jewellery. Every bolt, every nut, every curve, every component of the car feels like they spent years designing it. And even though they're not for everyone, they're oddball, as many of the cars that I love are, that is part of the reason why I love them so much. And we're not getting away from oddball designs anytime soon, because the next one was of course the hero car of the first episode of the first new series of 2020 on the channel, Hyperstars, and that is of course the Lister Storm. The Lister Storm, one of the most unique supercars ever built, the fastest four-seater in the world for over a decade, in fact more like 12 or 13 years, and yeah, a car that I've always loved. Fell in love with it in Gran Turismo 2, just like the Espas F1. It's an enduring favourite of mine, and even though it probably won't break my top 10 anytime soon, it's definitely one of those cars that's always up there for me. I would love to have the chance to drive one someday. In fact, I would probably classify it as a bucket list thing to do. And yeah, it, it's an awesome achievement, and one of the most undervalued supercars around. Next up, though, we take things a little bit slower and a lot lower with another classic American car. Just like the 59 DeVille, I love this car for the same reasons. The 62 Lincoln Continental, the car that was in The Matrix in the first movie in the rain. I love the design of this car. I think it looks pure gangster. White wall tires, lowered air suspension would be a perfect spec for me. Of course, in black with polished chrome. I just love it. I love the fact that it's a little bit more like a, an automotive tuxedo in terms of its design than the over-the-top DeVille with the huge fins. And what a difference two or three years in car design can make between those two. To me, if I could actually own one of the two, it would be this one. I love the Lincoln Continental. And again, it's one of the cars that will always be in my top 50. Next up, another bike. Not a Ducati again, of course, but this is a bike which has kind of fallen down the list a little bit for me. It's still, of course, my favourite motorcycle manufacturer overall, and definitely my favourite bike from said manufacturer, and the bike which inspired the colours of this channel, in fact. The Bemota YB6 
X up. If you watched the previous episode, we talked about, I believe it was two or three different Bomotas, the SB8, the Tessie 3D, and the SB2. And as I mentioned regarding the SB2, the way that Bomota names their bikes means that the first letter refers to the manufacturer where it got its engine. And in the case of this one, YB6 is, of course, Yamaha. But it's not one of those bikes that's just resting on the laurels of being rare and expensive. As far as I know, in the mid-80s, the YB6 was legitimately also the fastest bike you could buy. But moving away from the world of superbikes and back into the oddball territory, a car which has this weird enduring love for me. And it's a car which, unlike many of my other favourites, I actually... I'm not a huge fan of the look of as much as the idea of the vehicle, and that is the Sauvage Raval, a car which just will not get out of my top 50 and probably won't anytime soon, not that I want it to. I love how wacky, how weird, and how completely unique this car is. I would put it in the trifecta of ultimate practical supercars for me with the Lister Storm and another car that you already know is coming. And to me, the idea of a four door, four seater convertible super limo car thing <laughs> is awesome with like a 670 horsepower corvette sourced v8 205 miles an hour rear wheel drive phenomenal sound i'm a sucker for an american v8 and of course it's exclusive there are barely any of them around it was revived i believe by a chinese brand as a fully electric version but come on you, you got to stick with that v8 Next up, though, sticking on the same vein of American V8s, and also most definitely one of my legitimate dream cars, and funnily enough, one of my more attainable dream cars as well in terms of price, the Celine S331 Super Cab. This is, spoiler alert, my dream truck. There are only two trucks on the entire list, well, actually three if you include the Hummer, but pure trucks are the Dodge Ram and this one. This is my dream truck. I love everything about it. To me, it's like the Selena 7 of trucks, quite literally. 450 horsepower, supercharged V8. It sounds fantastic. It's rear-wheel drive, which although, eh, of course, all-wheel drive is cooler. You get better launch. But at the same time, drifting a pickup truck is inherently cool. It comes in yellow, which I love. I love the suicide doors, kind of Mazda RX-8 style. And yeah, it's just another example of genuine practicality, big beefiness that I love, and really good performance. And staying on track with the big and beefy theme, this is one of my actually even more attainable dream vehicles, but back in the bike world, a bike which, when I bring it up, many people on the channel don't really get my love for it, and that's fine, because I'm happy to die on the hill that is this bike, and that's the Boss Hoss. Many people haven't even heard of this bike, sometimes even bike fans haven't heard of it, which surprises me. It is, put simply, the Viper of the bike world. And no, the Tomahawk doesn't count, because it's barely even a bike. It has four wheels, for a start. This is a nuts bike. Sure, it looks like a 90s, slightly oversized Harley with a, a larger radiator grill than it looks like it needs, but trust me, this is a beast. It's actually got a Corvette engine, a 5.7 litre, 350 horsepower V8 straight from the factory, naturally aspirated. There are people who have twin turbo, supercharged, even nitro injected these. They're insane. It's one of the most powerful production bikes ever built, certainly one of the talkiest as well, and has a sound that is, of course, fantastic. It's a Corvette with handlebars. What's not to love? Next up we have a newcomer to the scene, to the list, which is very significant for me personally because it's one of only, I believe, two vehicles on this entire list that I've actually driven, and that is the BMW i8 Roadster. It may seem kind of high on the list, but as I said, you could swap some of these around, and even I myself would, but I already liked the BMW i8 when it first came out as a coupe. Then the open top version came out and I liked it even more, which is no surprise for me, buttresses for instance, but again, when I actually drove it, it just made me love it even more. They say don't meet your heroes and don't try things that you think you're going to like because they never deliver. Well, the i8 did for me. It made me like BMW more. It made me respect them more for actually making a car so different to everything else that they had. And I loved every minute of driving this car. I love the gullwing doors. They're so ridiculously unnecessary, but it feels so cool every time you get out of the car. It looks stunning. Every time I would drive past a group of people on the pavement, if they knew what it was, you could hear them whispering, I ate, under their breath. But nobody had that typical, oh, it's a Ferrari guy kind of response. There's something different about the BMW i8, and I love it for that. It's a car that people don't just 
get jealous about, like you would with a Ferrari or a Lambo, you appreciate it. It looks like this futuristic, forward-thinking thing, and I love it for that. Next up, we have another vehicle which I actually not only have on my dream vehicle list, but I actually have some pretty real goals of buying one of these before too long. A new bike, to my list for sure, and a bike which some of you might not know I actually like quite a lot. The KTM RC8, the Austrian powerhouse. I believe, if I recall correctly, a Ducati-sourced 1200cc V-twin, which is thumpy and talky and sounds phenomenal. I believe it may even be a similar unit, if not the same one as used in the Panigale. The performance is incredible, and I remember, just like the BMW i8, funnily enough, when KTM first announced this bike, I was shocked. I couldn't believe they were actually going to do something like this, considering that none of their other bikes were even close to being a superbike. There were all these off-roaders, great at what they did, but just never appealed to me. And then this came along, and over the years, I've just loved it more and more. I really want one of these, and I actually plan to buy one. Next up, though, we move into a vehicle that I probably won't be buying anytime soon, at least not unless I sell both of my kidneys and probably some of other people's too, the Panos GTR1. The final Panos of this episode, and spoiler alert, actually the final Panos of my list. So no, there is not a Panos in my top 10, but I certainly have a huge amount of love for them. As I said, they may even be my second or third favourite brand. I mean, it's a toss-up between them and Spiker for me, but this car is insane. It looks like nothing else. Of course, the racing version is awesome. The racing version was also the first hybrid ever at Le Mans, the nicknamed Sparky version, and the road car is incredible. One of the most exclusive and elusive exotics. You very rarely see these. Even in racing games, it doesn't pop up that much, and it always feels special when it does. That big 600 horsepower Ford V8, unique silhouette, the Batmobile of supercars, but also the fact that they will still build you one to this day, I think is awesome. So, anyone got a spare 700 grand by any chance? Next up once again though, changing back into the world of far more attainable performance, this is another motorbike that I would love to buy actually. Probably after the KTM, but we'll have to wait and see. A bike which I've always loved, but it's never actually featured in my top lists. However, I think it's the time to include it, because I really do love it that much, and I should have included it earlier, maybe even in the top 50, because it is one of my favourite vehicles. The MV Augusta F4, and in particular the R312 edition. This is put simply, and quite literally, the Zonda F of bikes. Not only is it Italian, not only does it mix the kind of excellent engineering that you would typically expect from Germany with Italian style, like Pagani does, but at the same time, it is overwhelmingly fast, and it doesn't need anything changed about it. The livery, the style, the design, it doesn't need fancy stickers, it doesn't need wings sprouting out of it, it doesn't need some kind of turbo or supercharger aspiration gimmick like certain Kawasaki's might. It has a top speed of 194 miles an hour, which was the fastest thing on the street with two wheels at the time, and now you can buy one of these used for about seven to eight thousand pounds. So again, as far as dream vehicles go, it's one of my more attainable options. But back into the fray of unattainable we go straight away with the second Celine of the list, and what a dream garage it would make, in fact. It doubled up a Celine S331 with, of course, a Celine S7. A car which I love the more I think about it. It's a car which is always in my top 50, top 100, sometimes even top 10 in the past, and you can easily see why, I think. As far as I'm concerned, it is America's best supercar ever. Not the fastest, but the best all round. It has the kind of real-world appeal and almost attainability that a Ford GT has, but at the same time it has the very legitimate potential to be one of the quickest things on the street, such as the twin-turbo version and even beyond that people have made, like crazy 2,000 horsepower all-wheel drive editions. Plus, it's a brilliant race car. The simplest way for me to describe how highly I think of the Selena 7 and how much I love it is to me, the Salina 7 is America's McLaren F1. Next up, we return to a class of vehicle which we haven't talked about in a little while in this episode, racing, with four race cars back to back, because these four are my four favorite race cars of all time. First up, a car which we talked about in Unsung Heroes. It's still my single favorite episode of Unsung Heroes, 
And it's a car which many people still don't know about. And if you want to know more, I would strongly urge you to check out the episode of Unsung Heroes that this is from. The Adams Escort Pontoon Can-Am. A car which, to the untrained eye, could look like a black version of the Chaparral 2J. And funnily enough, that's one of the reasons why I love it so much. This is a perfect rival to the Chaparral. They have such similar ideals, goals, and even ways of approaching Can-Am racing... They were not only in the same category of racing, but they both are totally based on the flow of air and controlling it to create downforce. Except the difference between them is the Chaparral took the mechanical approach of actually almost like the forced induction equivalent of controlling downforce with the fan system. This has the more naturally aspirated version of airflow, if you will, using a massive central Venturi tunnel to make it essentially the most impressive use of a Venturi downforce system ever seen in any car, to the point where this car legitimately put out so much downforce that it broke itself. The pontoon Can-Am is a juicy racing sandwich. Driver on the left, engine on the right, and sweet airflow in the middle. And speaking, of course, to its main rival as far as I'm concerned, obviously the Chaparral was going to be on the list, and of course it was going to be high on the list. The Chaparral 2J. Do I need to tell you anything about this car? The vast majority of you already know what it is and why it's so iconic. In my opinion, as much as I love the Adams Escort, I would still have to give the crown, in my opinion at least, of most innovative racing car of all time, to the Chaparral 2J. It was easily 40 or 50 years ahead of its time. It never actually won a race and it was dangerous when it broke down, which it did a few times. But come on, it's still an icon. It is, as far as I'm concerned, the ultimate example of function over form. And it's all the better for it. And as I said, we are sticking in the world of racing because this one is an important one. Many people will know how much I love Le Mans cars. Le Mans prototypes are my single favourite category of race car ever. And this, I'm very pleased to announce, is my new favourite Le Mans prototype ever. It's been one of my favourites for many years and I've finally gotten to the point where I can admit it. I'm capable of dethroning the Nissan R92 CP and this one is the car that has to take the place for me. It is a car which I believe is not only the most beautiful modern LMP, but I believe possibly the most beautiful Le Mans car of all time. And of course, it is the 5.9 litre, naturally aspirated V12, Gulf liveried, Aston Martin Lola B0960. A car which I wish, as much as I love diesels, I wish that this car had won Le Mans, because it deserves it based on its looks alone, and to me, as controversial as this may sound, I believe that this is the best car to ever utilise Golf livery, including the GT40. And on that bombshell, we move to the next car, <laughs> because the next one is my favourite race car of all time, period. And I mean, what a, what a lineup: the Pontoon, the Chaparral, the Lola... And of course, many of you already know what it is, because it uses my favourite engine of all time, and of course it's the only car to race using that engine and ever actually win. It is the Helmet TX. Gas turbine engine, similar looking to like a Lola or a GT40 of course, but what a machine. Incredible sound, 60,000 RPM redline, about 350 horsepower, and it's not the quickest thing around, but the fact that it proved, just like a certain motorcycle, that turbine technology can be built to win, of course it gets my respect. The fact that it's also pretty, sounds incredible, and is a race car just adds to the allure. And speaking of allure, the next one certainly is, and it's, I believe, possibly the single most beautiful four-door car of all time. And I think the only four-door car to be more beautiful than the Maserati Quattroporte, and that is of course another one of my dream cars, the Aston Martin Rapide. My favourite Aston Martin, spoiler alert I guess, but also a car which I think is just the perfect package. Once again, I love the look, I love the sound, I love the practicality, I even love the used prices because it's actually far more reasonable than you might think, especially in either silver or black. I think it's just an incredible looking car. It's a genuine four-door, four-seater supercar. And number 11, in effect, on the list, the final car of this episode before we break down my final set-in-stone top 10, at least for 2020, we of course have to return to the world of Renovo, or at least what the Renovo is based on, because of course the Shelby Daytona Cobra is legitimately 
one of my favourite cars of all time. But not just any Shelby Daytona, this is much like the GT40 from the previous episode, the modern reinterpretation of it from super performance, technically super performance I think is their name, but it sounds kind of weird. It's the modernised idea, it has bigger rims, wheels that actually fit in the arches properly, which always helps, modern technology to some degree, at least in terms of manufacturing, so stuff like body panels and panel gaps are actually correct these days, instead of back in the 60s, and to me, again, another hot take that I have, I genuinely believe that the Daytona Cobra is the most beautiful car of all time, and even though it's not actually in my top 10, the design alone <laughs> earns it the 11 spot, and of course, it's one of my dream cars. Ultimately though, that is it for the second to last part, part 4 of the HSG Top 100, and of course, as I said, episode 5 is the last one, my top 10 favourites. Some amazing cars and bikes in this episode, and it really was a difficult one, too difficult, as I said, to put into a specific order, but I really do legitimately adore every single one of the vehicles that I talked about in this episode, and that is why it was so difficult to order them. But tell me down below once again, which ones of these do you love? Which ones do you maybe not like? There's certainly a lot more controversial vehicles in terms of styling in this episode, but of course, it's a personal list, so it's always going to be that way. But tell me down below. Of course, stick around tomorrow, tomorrow <laughs> for the final episode, and until then, I'll see you next time. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.